Welcome back, guys. It's time for lesson 39, our very last lesson of the semester. This is basically just for fun. Um, I wanted to make an attempt to describe for you guys the idea of the Higgs boson and just a tiny bit about string theory, just to kind of get you started. And uh, so let's begin. First of all, we need to talk about Lagrangians. This monstrosity is the complete Lagrangian of the standard model, at least in, in one formulation. This is due to uh, Veltman and Guterres. And uh, Guterres just typed it up. Veltman, I think, uh, describes it in his book on the standard model. And uh, it doesn't appear in this form in the book, but the pieces of it are all there. And then Guterres sort of put it all into one monstrosity, one enormous Lagrangian. And uh, it's pretty overwhelming. But uh, what, so what good is it? What good is a Lagrangian? So the reason I put this up here is I wanted to talk about Lagrangians, and I wanted to point out that you could express the entire standard model in a single algebraic expression that describes the fields and the particles and their interactions and everything else. It's, uh, it evaluates to a number. This, uh, all the vector notation and so on, when you get done and the smoke clears, all you get is a number that depends on uh, where you are and uh, what the value of all the fields and so on are. So, why? Um, basically, the Lagrangian encapsulates everything we can know about what's going on. So, it's a very compact notation that contains a lot of information, and from it we can figure out how to compute the probability of different kinds of events occurring. So that's why they're useful. It, uh, it includes the strength of interactions and all the masses and charges and everything else. And uh, basically, in, at the end of the day, all the fundamental theories that we have can be expressed using this formalism. And it turns out that not only that, but the the Lagrangian has embedded in it all the conservation laws because it turns out the symmetry of the Lagrangian dictates what's conserved and what's not. And that is also another interesting thing. Sometimes it's not what you'd expect. And finally, um, there's a famous quote by Einstein that says, you want to make things as simple as you can, but no simpler. As simpler as you can get away with, but if you make it too simple, you'll throw away something interesting. So let me remind you guys how Lagrangians work. Here's a classical physics Lagrangian. You might have run into this in your study of theoretical mechanics. It's the Lagrangian of a mass on a spring. So it's got two pieces. It's got the first piece, which is 1 half mx dot squared. You probably recognize that as the kinetic energy of a mass that's moving around. x dot is just the velocity. And uh, the next term is the potential energy, but it's negative. So it's the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. In this case, the potential energy is 1 half kx squared. But as usual, I don't want to use k because I don't want you to get mixed up with some kind of a wave number. So uh, we used m omega squared instead. And the idea is that from the Lagrangian, you can compute something that's called the action. And the action is simply the integral of the Lagrangian over some time interval. And when you integrate that, you get, again, a number. The Lagrangian evaluates to a number. It's the difference between the kinetic energy and the potential energy. When you integrate the Lagrangian over time, you get another number. It has units, um, <coughs> excuse me, it's going to be units of energy times time. So that uh, starts to smell a little bit like... Um, an, well, it's an action. It's like uh, momentum times distance or energy times time. Um, that is the same units that h-bar has, by the way. And uh, so what's the deal? Well, the idea of using a la classical Lagrangian is that the path that minimizes the action is the path that provide that the particle actually follows. So the idea is to demand that the action be minimized, and that's written as delta s equals zero, where the delta here doesn't rep represent uh, a change in s. What it means is small variations of the trajectory do not affect 
Yes. It's kind of like the condition to find a minimum of a function. You look for the place where the slope is zero, where changing x by a little bit doesn't affect y very much, or at all, where the slope goes to zero. Um, so I guess technically this isn't looking for a minimum, it's looking for an extremum, but in the case that I'm giving you, it's actually a minimum. And uh, you can show, and you probably did show when you took your analytical mechanics class, that the, that the requirement that s be, uh, that the variation in s be zero gives rise to a differential equation that works for any Lagrangian, that is the time derivative of the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to the x dot is equal to the space derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to x. And uh, in this case, of course, dl dx dot, you can see right away, it's just going to be the momentum, it's mx dot, and the time derivative of the momentum, of course, is mx double dot. Uh, then dl dx is going to be uh, m omega squared x uh, with a minus sign, minus m omega squared x. Of course, that's nothing other than the force. So in this example, you can see that this reduces to force on the right and rate of change in momentum on the left. And so what we have is simply Newton's second law. And uh, you can see right away that that gives you a differential equation for the motion of a mass on a spring. So that's how Lagrangian works in the classical case of a particle moving around in a potential. <coughs> the point is, from the Lagrangian, you can extract equations of motion. Now, how do we uh, generalize this to a field? Okay, so a field exists at any point in time and space. So it's not just a coordinate, but it's actually a function of time and space. And this, I'm, I'm describing in this slide a, a scalar field. It's just like a temperature or a, a mass density or something, which just depends on, it's just a number, which depends on time and space. You can also have, of course, vector fields, like the vector potential or the electric field or the magnetic field or something like that. Or... Uh, and we're going to talk about spinner fields and so on. But uh, in this case, the funny notation there is the relativistic notation for a coordinate in space. The superscript, if it's a Greek letter, is going to go from the 0 to 4, where 0 is the time, and 1, 2, and 3 are x, y, and z, the spatial coordinates. So that's the meaning of that. Also, for derivatives, if you want to take the derivative with respect to a spatial or time coordinate, you get a subscript now, because the notice the thing downstairs has a superscript, but when you divide by something with a superscript, you get a, you get a subscript. That's kind of the way it works. And, uh, and so we'll either use partial with a subscript, or we'll use comma. So comma also means differentiation. And the other thing is, uh, if you want to evaluate a derivative with a superscript, that's a little bit different thing. You do the subscript version and then you use the metric to convert back to a superscript. So, and remember the flat space-time metric is just one for time and minus ones for all the other spatial coordinates. And so all it does is flip the sign of the x, y, and z derivatives if you have the superscript version. And then what you do is express the action now it used to be the integral of the Lagrangian over just time, but now we're doing a Lagrangian density. So in order to calculate the action with a Lagrangian density, you have to integrate over the volume of space and time. And the old Lagrangian depended on x and x dot, the coordinates and the time derivatives of the coordinates. This Lagrangian is going to depend on the field and the derivatives of the field. So comma sub nu means that. And uh, if you play the same game, try to make the action uh, have zero variation under fluctuations in the field. Again, you get a differential equation. It's a little bit like the differential equation for um, the simple classical Lagrangian. And, but in this case, uh, it's got derivatives of the Lagrangian with respect to the field and with respect to the derivatives of the field. So that's kind of how that works. And I, I want to point out a couple things. Um, the zero component of the derivative of phi is just d phi dt. The 
the first spatial component is d phi dx, but the superscript version of d phi dt is still d phi dt because the metric is a 1 in the time component, but the superscript 1 derivative of phi is minus d phi dx, and of course that's also true of d phi dy and d phi dz. So if I come up with a, uh, an expression like this, d mu phi d mu phi, the fact that the <coughs> the fact that the mu's are repeated, there's a convention that Einstein cooked up. When you have the same index upstairs and downstairs, that's a shorthand that means you're supposed to sum over all the indices. So if we let mu go from zero to one, so we're going to do the time and the space part. This is shorthand for the expression I have there. It's the time derivative squared minus the space derivative squared, and that's the minus comes from the metric, and uh, you can see that that gives you a scalar, and it's a scalar that's the difference between the time and space derivatives of the field squared. Okay, so um, I want to start with those pieces, and then let's do a simple example that is a Lagrangian that has the thing we just described, plus a term that's proportional to phi squared. Notice that it's um, like a potential energy term, but it goes like phi squared. It, in fact, it may remind you a little bit of the simple harmonic oscillator. But uh, let's then uh, write out the Lagrangian explicitly in terms of the time and space derivatives. It looks like this. And then use the uh, Euler equation, basically the differential equation that minimizes the action using this Lagrangian density, and see what we get. First, it's the derivative of the Lagrangian density with respect to the time derivative of phi. Well, the time derivative of phi comes in squared, so if we take the derivative of L with respect to that, we're going to get d phi dt. That's the same thing as d super phi, which is the same as d sub phi since they're equal to each other. But I want to write it as d super phi for now, because if you take the derivative with respect to the space component, you'll notice that you get minus d phi dx, but that's the same as phi super 1, or uh, partial super 1 phi. So both of these look like partial super, and what that means is, in general, I can write dl d phi comma mu as, phi, as partial super phi. In other words, this is just a shorthand. It comes out um, the same for both the time and the space components. That's the idea. Now, let's take what we got there and go ahead and uh, rewrite it. So you can see that uh, if I take the mu derivative of dl d phi comma mu, it's going to be the second derivative of phi with respect to time minus the second derivative of phi with respect to x. In other words, I'm using the Einstein summation convention to add those pieces together, and you can see that uh, that's how it comes out. Starting to look a little bit like a wave equation. Now what about the right-hand side? I just want to take dl d phi. The only term that has just phi in it is that mass term. And so we put that in, and we get an expression that looks a little bit like a wave equation, shockingly. And let's look at the pieces. Notice that in our conventional quantum mechanics, we've been doing the Schrodinger equation that d phi dt kind of looks like an energy. It's minus an energy squared in this case, if you take the second derivative. And then um, the second derivative with respect to space looks like a momentum squared. And the last term is a mass term. If, you, if we work in units where c is 1 and h bar is 1, which is often convenient, then you recognize here the relativistic relationship between energy, momentum, and mass. And so what we have here is a wave equation that describes a relativistic particle of mass m. This is the so-called Klein-Gordon equation. Now, it, um, the other thing is that because phi is a simple scalar, it turns out that it represents a particle with spin zero. And uh, the point is, the whole point of that exercise was to notice that if you start with a 
free field Lagrangian of a particle, you end up with a wave equation, in this case an equation of motion, that tells you how the field behaves. That's the idea. Now this was the uh, Lagrangian of a spin zero particle of mass m. Uh, just for fun, I want to point out some other Lagrangians that also lead to well-known equations, and I'm just going to tell you what they are. We're not going to try to do a lot with them. Um, the first is a spin one vector field. It's called the Praca Lagrangian, and it produces uh, equations of motion for a vector field with a spin of one. And then the Dirac Lagrangian, if you apply the uh, minimization or the extremation of the action with this guy out pops the Dirac equation, which is sort of, so both of these guys give you wave equations that are appropriate for particles of different spin, and the Dirac equation, of course, is the relativistically correct equation that describes particles of spin one-half. Okay, L let's look at the Dirac uh, Lagrangian a little bit, and I, I want to describe a kind of uh, the basically it's the way that uh, conservation laws are related to symmetries in the Lagrangian. At least this is part of the story. There's there's a there's a great deal of literature on this relationship. The fact that momentum conservation and energy conservation and charge conservation can all be derived through symmetries from the Lagrangian. But let's, here's a simple transformation you can imagine. Let's see what happens if we transform the wave function everywhere by multiplying by a phase factor. This is called a global phase transformation. And the thing you have to realize is that the, the psi bars in this expression are kind of like complex conjugate. They're sort of spinner equivalents of complex conjugates. And uh, they get, if you, if you multiply psi everywhere by e to the plus i theta, you're going to multiply psi bar everywhere by e to the minus i theta, and you'll notice that psi and psi bar always show up in pairs. There is a spatial derivative on one of the psi's, but if theta is just a number, the spatial derivative doesn't do anything, and you see that the Dirac Lagrangian is invariant under this transformation. So this is called a global phase transformation because we're multiplying the wave function we're multiplying the field everywhere by um, a constant phase. Now what happens if we try to do the same trick, but this time we use a local phase? What that means is that at every point in space, we're allowed to use a different value of theta. Theta can be now a function of position. Well, if we do that, you see right away there's trouble because the first thing we, that the Dirac Lagrangian has in it is a derivative with respect to x mu. And you know, if you take the derivative with respect to x mu, you're going to get a term that's got the derivative of theta with respect to x mu. And that thing is not going to be invariant. In other words, the Lagrangian is not invariant under the influence of a local phase transformation. So that's unfortunate. That means the Lagrangian goes to the Lagrangian minus some junk. But here's an idea. What if we invented a new field, we define gamma to be proportional to theta, and we define a new field which transforms uh, under a local phase transformation, a local phase factor, it transforms in such a way that you have to add a piece to it, the gradient of a scalar, and um, mix that in the Lagrangian. In other words, put in the Lagrangian a term that's got this new field in it in such a way that when you make a local phase transformation, the extra term that shows up from the Dirac Lagrangian is absorbed by the extra term that shows up from this new field Lagrangian. So that's what we're going to do. And, uh, but but once we create this new field, this sort of field to pick, pick up the slop that comes out as a consequence of the local gauge transformation, it's going to need a free Lagrangian of its own. And so we, and in this case, we could talk about a, uh, it's a vector field. And so we could add the Praca Lagrangian. But here's the trouble. 
while the first part of the Praca Lagrangian, the part that has to do with the differences in the derivatives of the field, it is unaffected by this additional piece. The second part that has a nu, a mu, it turns out it, uh, it is affected, and so we can't, um, we can't keep it. That means that this term, which has mass, has to be zero. So what we discovered is that in order to, in, in order to uh, keep the Lagrangian locally gauge invariant, we can do it by adding a spin one field into the thing that transforms under the phase uh, transformation with a kind of a gauge transformation, the same kind of gauge transformation we talked about before, then um, then everything will work out so long as this new vector field doesn't have any mass. So the full Lagrangian now that is locally gauge invariant, or locally phase invariant, I guess, um, is going to look something like this. We've got the original Dirac Lagrangian that describes free electrons and positrons. We've got, uh, and, and that could be, you could think of that as a Feynman diagram, which is a straight line. We've got the uh, this new field, which turns out to be, you can guess already, I suppose, it's the vector potential. It's the vector potential field, and uh, that describes photons. Photons are basically spin one particles with no mass, okay? And uh, what's the thing in between? Oh, of course, photons are the squiggly lines. What's the thing in between? It's the interaction between the spin one half particles and the photons. And so that's our interaction term. And that came for free just by trying to make the theory, the Lagrangian, independent of a local phase variation. That's the idea. So let's, uh, let's think about that. In order to make the thing invariant, we had to add a new field that slopped up the extra term. And that new field turns out to be a spin one particle. And it had to have no mass because the mass term would have spoiled the gauge invariance that we got, uh, that we started out to produce. So, interesting. Okay, let's march ahead. I know this is very quick, and I've left out details, but I just wanted to get the idea out there. Now, here's the Lagrangian density we used for our spin zero scalar field. And I wanted to point out, and I've already said it basically, but the first term acts kind of like a kinetic energy. The second term acts a little bit like a potential energy. And notice it's the second term that has the mass. The mass came out of the second term in the Lagrangian density. And uh, by the way, this if you pushed on this same theory, the, uh, the force, if, if this field carried a force, the force would behave like the Yukawa potential. This is basically the same field we talked about a few lessons ago, and out came the Yukawa potential. So it's the, the same idea, but the mass determines the distance over which that, that uh, interaction is effective. Um, let's imagine, here, start with a new Lagrangian. Start with a new Lagrangian. Um, this one looks a little bit similar, but notice the mass part is positive. And then it's got this other term that goes like phi to the fourth. What we just learned about Lagrangians is that the phi squared term sort of looks like the particle moving along. And the phi to the fourth, if you remember the interaction was psi psi times uh, a mu. So, and the, and the Feynman diagram had three pieces, the electron coming in, the electron going out, and the photon going out. And, and it turns out there's a connection between the structure of the Lagrangian and terms that can appear in the Feynman diagram. So this phi to the fourth looks like a Feynman diagram where you've got phi coming in, you've got four phi's connected together. So this looks like a self-interaction term of some kind, which is mildly interesting. But uh, what I want to point out that that corresponds to a potential energy. Remember that Lagrangian is kinetic energy minus potential energy. So the structure of this Lagrangian is that, that it's got a, p a potential energy that goes like minus one half m squared phi squared plus one fourth l squared phi to the fourth. 
And uh, let's think about what that looks like. It's kind of a weird mass term because the mass terms we've been dealing with come in with a minus sign. This one has a, a plus sign in the Lagrangian, which means the mass is somehow imaginary. And uh, if you graph the potential energy as a function of phi, you'll see what the trouble is. The trouble is that the, uh, the slope of the potential does go to zero at the origin, but it's not stable. The mass squared is negative. Um, on the other hand, there are places in the potential where the, there are minima, and you can see where they are. You set the uh, derivative of u with respect to phi equal to zero. You solve for phi, and you get two places where phi has a minimum, and uh, it turns out to be plus or minus m over l. And uh, the question is, what do we make of that? Well, one way to make some sense of it is to let's expand the field around the minima. So we can write eta as phi minus its minimum value, phi minus the value it has when it's a minimum, and then uh, put that back into the potential, put that back into the Lagrangian, and see what comes out. Notice that now, as in contrast to what we had before, um, now we have a mass term that has the proper sign. It's minus m squared eta. So it looks like this describes particles that have a mass of the square root of 2 times m. A little bit heavier, but at least they're real. At least they're real. Also notice that in the eta field, we've got an eta cubed term. And that would correspond to a new Feynman diagram that didn't exist in the old one, just because we're expanding the field about a different place. So this also relates to uh, symmetry breaking. There's, a, there's another field we could study where you've got a real part and an imaginary part. It would be a complex scalar field. And uh, in that case, everything basically is the same except the phi has a real part and an imaginary part. And so this diagram can be rotated, uh, revolved about the central axis, and it becomes a sort of a three-dimensional picture with a uh, symmetry about the axis, but um, you've got a, a continuous set of minimum values. And when you pick one, that process of picking a particular place to expand the field is called symmetry breaking. In other words, uh, you've got to choose a point where you're going to expand the field about and uh, proceed from there, and that process, that's where the term symmetry breaking comes from. You can see, just looking at it, that expanding the field about the minimum, the symmetry that was there at the beginning about the origin is no longer there. So just a little lingo, kind of brighten your day. Uh, <laughs> so the point is the mass of the field expanded about the minimum is related to the curvature of the potential about that point. And the other thing to notice is that now the new ground state of the eta field is, um, is also going to be the lowest energy state of the phi field, but it's not at a place where phi is zero. In other words, phi has a non-zero value even in its vacuum or ground state. So the phi field exists. Um, what I want to point out is now if we imagine going back to our uh, an, another Lagrangian, which is kind of a superposition. Imagine we had a Lagrangian that described a free massless field. Notice there's no mass uh, term. Then we have another field that has mass, but a non-zero ground state. So the chi field here is some kind of a field that has a non-zero ground state and um, it's got the symmetry breaking and all that stuff. And there's an interaction between the chi field and the phi field. This interaction term effectively behaves like a mass. Because the chi field is non-zero in vacuum, it means that even in the vacuum, there's a term here that takes the place of a mass term. And notice that the, there's a proportionality between this term and um, and what would normally be called mass, and it has to do with the strength of the interaction between the chi field and the phi field. So um, there you have it. That's 
Also, I forgot to mention it on the slide. I don't want to leave it out. If you go back to the slide that described the interaction between the uh, Dirac field and the photon field, you'll notice that it was proportional to the charge. That proportionality constant has to do with the strength of interaction between the spin one-half particles and the photons. The G here plays exactly the same role. So the G would be something like the mass charge, but it, it's just a number which represents how strongly do the phi's and the chi's interact with each other. Okay, now on to strings. This is going to be really quick because I know I'm taking a long time. Um, first of all, I want to describe Einstein's theory. I want to describe the extension to Einstein's theory called the Kaluza-Klein theory. And then we're just going to describe the string action. In other words, uh, what does the action look like for strings? And uh, let's march ahead. First, general relativity. The idea of general relativity is that matter and energy distort space-time. Matter and energy tell space-time how to curve. On the other hand, space-time tells matter how to move. Matter moves through space-time in such a way that minimizes the space-time distance that it goes, okay? And that also gives you a hint about how you could formulate a space-time Lagrangian. Um, the bottom line is gravity is a geometrical effect, a geometrical in the sense that it has to do with the geometry of space and time itself. So what's the idea of quantum gravity? Um, it, to, quant to, to generate a theory of quantum gravity, it turns out the field is the space-time metric. In other words, the thing that corresponds to the field is actually the metric that describes the geometry of space and time. The Lagrangian depends on the space-time metric, and the Einstein-Hilbert action, which is what we're going to get to here in a minute, um, it has problems. It's worse than the Yang-Mills theory, which describes the color uh, Lagrangian. It, it's not renormalizable, and it doesn't terminate. You just have to keep going on and on and on. And so that's the trouble, and that's part of the reason why string theory uh, was developed. But there was another reason. It had to do with this Kaluza-Klein extension. So this is the metric that describes general relativity. It's uh, I'm, I'm not saying that right. This is the action that describes general relativity. If you apply the minimization procedure to this action, out come Einstein's equations. Um, it has two pieces. One is the determinant of the space-time metric, and the other is the Ricci scalar. What is a Ricci scalar? Well, it has to do with the Christ Christoffel symbols, which are related to derivatives of the space-time metric. And uh, they basically tell you how to take derivatives in space-time when space-time is curved. So how do you take complete derivatives of things? You need to take into account the derivatives of the metric, is what it boils down to. Uh, from the Christoffel symbols, you can generate something called the Riemann curvature tensor. It's a four-component object that depends on the derivatives of the Christoffel symbols and their products. So you can see how it's formed here. You can contract the Riemann space-time curvature tensor um, in two indices and generate what's called the Ricci tensor. It's a two-component object that describes the curvature of space-time. And from that, you can contract farther, further, excuse me, you can contract further and get a scalar. This is the Ricci scalar. Wow, it's complicated. Um, but anyway, if you minimize this action, um, the differential equation that you get is basically the Einstein equation. Now, Kaluza and Klein developed a model where you extend space-time to a fifth dimension. So you've got time, three dimensions of space, and then another dimension that's somehow hidden. You could think of it as kind of a loop um, that goes around and meets itself, a rolled-up dimension, a cylinder of some kind. What I want to do is to integrate over that last dimension and see what that tells us. Well, if you integrate over the last dimension, you're going to end up multiplying by a, and so you see that if you just integrate over that one dimension, you're going to get back to the original metric. And so if you embed in the five-dimensional metric and uh, the four-dimensional metric of Einstein's theory of relativity, you will recover Einstein's theory of relativity if you simply integrate the action over the last dimension. But that's not all because uh, you can show that if the 
deviation of the metric from the flat space-time metric is small. In other words, if HAB is small, then shifting all the positions in five dimensions by a little bit affects the, perturba the perturbative part of the metric by amounts that are proportional to the derivative of the shift with respect to the different um, directions. Okay. Now, if you make the uh, four space-time components of the shift zero, in other words, you don't shift in real time or real space, or the conventional four dimensions of space and time, and you make the shift in the fifth dimension independent of the value of the fifth dimension coordinate. In other words, if the partial with respect to x5 of the fifth component of the shift is zero, then it turns out that the four components of the metric don't change, and the fifth component of the metric in the five direction doesn't change. Um, however, you will get a shift in the zero to four components of the fifth element of the metric. And so you get a shift that uh, only affects the last dimension in terms of its effect on the metric, but if you identify that vector as a, a vector um, a mu, and you identify a e5 as the scalar uh, gamma, you get exactly the same result as the gauge shift that we did back on the Dirac equation. In other words, this behaves just like a vector field from E and M. So the idea is that if you add a fifth dimension, that you can get out of that fifth dimension a force that's not gravity, but it behaves like electricity and magnetism. And uh, you can also show that it's possible to extend to higher dimensions and get something like a Yang-Mills theory. Now this is all not right because you end up predicting other things that don't actually happen, but one of the consequences is an electromagnet a force like electromagnetism. And the idea of string theory, at least part of the idea, is to extend the dimensions of space and time to incorporate the properties of all the other forces of nature. So let's, uh, let's talk about that. Basically, uh, this is the action of general relativity. Um, in string theory, you basically come up with an action of strings. So this is uh, an action of a world sheet. A world sheet is kind of like a world line, except it's a two-dimensional surface in a higher dimensional space. In fact, it could be a nine-dimensional surface in a ten-dimensional space. But, the, but a couple of things that does, um, because we're converting world lines to world sheets, there are no longer any point interactions. And you can show that a lot of the trouble with conventional quantum field theory with the standard model is that when we model interactions as point interactions, it leads to infinities. And the hope is that by changing to uh, world sheets and strings that interact um, over an extended space, that, uh, that we'll eliminate some of those infinities. And, uh, and that is a hope of string theory. The other thing is, different string modes, vibrations of strings in different modes in these dimensions, higher dimensions, um, lead to different energies and then different spring, string properties. So uh, in the current iteration of string theory, it's uh, basically uh, something like a 10-dimensional theory, and um, those 10 dimensions, the ones you can't see, are sort of wrapped up, curled up tightly in such a way that they don't appear in our everyday lives. And they fit into what are called Calabi-Yau spaces on very tiny scales. And the strings vibrate and have different uh, properties depending on the modes of vibration is the idea. All string theories have a graviton and other particles but there is no single string theory yet that predicts the standard model. So uh, interesting, I, I know this has all been very vague, but uh, it's interesting business, and I hope you uh, decide to pursue it and kind of learn a little bit about it. We'll talk to you guys soon.